my pleasure to introduce a discussion between award-winning journalist and professor Peter Grester and Dr. Helen Wolfenden. First, I'd like to acknowledge that Macquarie University sits on the land of the Watamatical clan of the Darug Nation um, and extend that acknowledgement to elders past and present. I'd also like to thank our tech team, Mike Baber and Alex Ryan, for setting this up. Professor Peter Grester is an academic, filmmaker, journalist and author. He's currently Professor of Journalism here at Macquarie University. He came to academia in 2018 after a 30-year career as an award-winning foreign correspondent for the BBC, Reuters, CNN and Al Jazeera in some of the world's most volatile places, from Afghanistan to Latin America, Africa and the Middle East. He's reported on, from the front lines and beyond. In 2011, he won a Peabody, sorry, a Peabody Award for a documentary on Somalia called Land of Anarchy for the BBC's flagship current affairs program, Panorama. He is best known, perhaps, for becoming a headline himself uh, when he and two of his colleagues were arrested in Cairo while working for Al Jazeera and charged with terrorism offences. In letters smuggled from prison, he described the arrests as an attack on media freedom. The letters helped launch a global campaign that eventually got them released after more than 400 days in prison. His struggle helped earn him numerous awards, including from the British Royal Television Society and Walkley Foundation, the RSL, the Australian Human Rights Commission and the International Association of Press Clubs. In 2017, with two colleagues, he established the advocacy group, the Alliance for Journalism, Journalists' Freedom, uh, which actively campaigns for media freedom across Australia and the Asia-Pacific region. As an academic, he leads a research program investigating the impacts of national security legislation on public interest journalism. Peter is the author of The First Casualty, about his experiences in Egypt and the wider war on journalism. In discussion with Peter, we have Helen Wolfenden. Helen is a lecturer in radio at Macquarie University. She spent much of her professional life as a radio broadcaster, presenter, producer, manager and researcher, with both the ABC and uh, the BBC. Helen's practice-based research uh, interests include podcasting, the role of radio producers, and radio as a research tool. But more broadly, Helen is interested in the intersections of professional and academic knowledge and their usefulness to each other. I'll now hand over to Helen and Peter. Peter, thank you for coming and having a chat to us and telling us about your life and your work. Um, I think the challenge for me is how to contain a conversation which could go <laughs> on for forever. But I wanted to start with how an Aussie journalist gets to work for some of the biggest international media organisations in the world, Al Jazeera, Reuters, CNN, BBC. How did that happen? Gosh, um, more by accident than design, I guess. <laughs> Happy accidents. Um, I have been working in Australia as a freelance, not as a freelance, I've been working in Australia for, as a journalist for, for, for a few years and I was getting itchy feet and I read a book uh, called One Crowd an Hour, which is a biography of Neil Davis. Um, I thoroughly recommend it to all to any journalism student, just don't show your parents. Because <laughs> um, Neil Davis was um, a cameraman and correspondent um, working across Southeast Asia and he died in um, a failed coup in Thailand, in Bangkok. But the story, what Neil did, the story of that kind of combination of adventure in an extraordinary part of the world, after a, in a really incredible part of its history, really captivated me. His adventure, but also his professionalism and his integrity. And those two things together really caught my imagination. So when the 10 Network, who I was working for at the time in Adelaide, uh, went into receivership, they closed down the London Bureau to save money. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. Here, you know, here's an opportunity. Um, so I marched into my boss's office and said, look, if I quit um, and go to London and work as a freelance, pay my own way there, will, will you use me? They said, well, sure, you know, why not? I was a known quantity, it didn't cost them anything, and, and I was able to get a client. Now, in the end, I didn't do a great deal for, for the 10 Network, but it got me into the media circles in London, 
and um, I started shopping myself around and started doing some freelance work for Viz News, which was later to become Reuters TV and BBC World Service. Um, and then, yeah, managed to take myself off to, um, to Yugoslavia during the war. Um, and, you know, that was the start of, of doing the kinds of stories that, and learning how, that, um, how to work as a foreign correspondent, learning how to find the stories that were of interest, not just find the stories, but also to craft stories that were going to be of interest to an audience back home. Uh, yeah, I'm keen to find out more about that because I think, you know, Australia can be a bit parochial. We've got a great big island to ourselves. We're not used to having to share. Um, but I, before I go on to that, I think, you know, that story that you tell um, about kind of creating your own luck to some extent is <laughs> yeah. something that you often hear about, particularly people who want to work in international journalism. Yeah, so, you know, in a way, they say that, you know, the, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, but also I think if you if you shift your mindset into the kind of framing, um, you, you, you start to see opportunities. So what happened was that I I'd, um, met this flamehead Irish girl in a pub in London as all oh, good stories see where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> One of those she stories. Was dancing on the bar in this pub and, and, and really having a great time. And I, I, I just, I, I was smitten. Um, and I started talking to her. I was chatting her up. Um, but it turns out that she was a bit of a Catholic evangelical who was about to go off on this amazing trip on a pilgrimage to a place called Magigori in, in Yugoslavia and um, in, the middle of, of, in the middle of Bosnia during the war. And I thought, well, I said, well, this is an amazing story. And she says, well, why, why didn't you come? And I just, I just dismissed it. You know, I thought this is ridiculous. There's no way I'm going to go off and follow some girl into the middle of a war zone. But I told the story about this crazy girl who'd invited me on this trip to Yugoslavia to a couple of friends of mine who worked for the Australian and the ABC. And within a couple of days, I got messages from the foreign editors of both saying, look, for God's sake, if you're at all thinking of going to Yugoslavia, let us know because we're really in the market for freelance stories. I thought, well, it's a no-brainer, really. You've got the clients and the story, and there's the girl. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's the perfect combination. Uh, it's a perfect combination. Why wouldn't you go? But, and I obviously ne never really went very far with, with the girl. Um, <laughs> she wrote to me while I was in prison in Egypt, and I wrote back to her once and oh, said, wow. oh, you know, you realise that you're to blame for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but what it was, was, what it did was that it, it was that seeing that opportunity and recognising that there was actually real value in that. Um, and it cost me a lot. I mean, I lost a lot of money on that first trip because I had to pay for my own body armour, I had to pay for really expensive transport, expensive accommodation in, in places like Sarajevo. But I also, and I n always knew it would cost me, but I recognised that there was an opportunity to file stories, to establish a reputation, to establish contacts in a place that, in, in a role that I was really, really wanting to be a part of. Um, <clears throat> and so I came out of Yugoslavia after, after um, three or four months, um, having done quite a few stories. And then in 1994, the South African elections came up, Nelson Mandela was free, we saw the end of, we saw apartheid about to end. And I approached the same clients, the Australian and the ABC, and said, look, how about South Africa? They said yes, um, and so off I went. Again, paid my own way, but again, I didn't make money, but I broke even that trip. Again, because it was a huge story, because I knew it would, it would be undercovered. I knew there was a lot of Australian interest in those in, in that big story, and um, again, it was a, it was a chance to have that front row seat to history that I was really really excited by. I came back from South Africa and um, started thinking about doing some other work with the BBC, because my plan was to get a job, get some freelance work at the BBC, and then when I, um, at World Service, and then when I had a relationship with them, when I knew them, and they knew me, I'd find a place that was undercovered and then go off and start stringing. But what happened was I thought, well, look, rather than simply send my CV in and have some secretary stick it in the round file, I'd apply for a job. Now, the, the job itself wasn't important. What was important was the application process because that way the management would be forced to look at my CV to consider me as, as, as an employee and then when I didn't get the job, I'd say, look, thanks very much for considering me, but by the way, I'm also in the market for freelancing. It was a way of getting in mm -hmm. there. 
When I made that decision, the first job that I that popped up was the Kabul correspondence job. And I looked at it and I remember thinking, Christ, thank God I'm not going to get this because this was, it was sheer hell. I mean, there was a front line running through the middle of Kabul at the time. Um, it was, the, they boasted that the Bureau had its own, its own underground bunker, its own sandbag barriers. Um, you know, it was just insane. You're not selling it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I wasn't sold. And as I said, I was, I was thinking, phew, I'm, I'm really pleased this is not going to happen. But I applied for the job and they gave it to me. <laughs> and, and I was completely floored, but they gave it to me because of that experience that I'd had, the demonstrated experience that I had in Yugoslavia and South Africa. Now, I'm not suggesting, by the way, that, that anyone listening to this um, thinks that they've got to go off to, say, Ukraine and start covering the war there, because a lot of inexperienced journalists get killed in these kinds of environments. And frankly, I was lucky. But you talk about creating your own luck. I think it's about being on the front foot. It's about seeing opportunities, looking for opportunities, seeing them and taking punt backing yourself and recognising that pretty much anyone who's out there is, is also in a, has been in a similar situation at some point. Um, and coming back with the experience so that even if it doesn't work as you expect, you've still got incredibly valuable experience which is always going to, going to help um, get the kinds of jobs that you're interested in. And, and, and it worked out for me. From the BBC, I went to Belgrade with uh, Reuters again, and then I went back to the BBC for a few years and then started travelling around the world. Um, you know, it was, and, and 26 years later, um, I'm back in Australia. And it's those sorts of skills you need as well, though, isn't it, in terms <coughs> of innovative problem solving, <coughs> thinking outside of the box, that you need to tell good stories as yeah. well, right? And that's it. And, and this is one of the things that, that what editors look for when they're looking to hire someone in that kind of role is someone who has that cre those creative problem solving still skills, who's able to work um, on their own without without you know without babying, without having to nurse every step of the way. They want people who have the, the, the confidence in themselves to be able to operate in a difficult environment. Um, and just by going and doing and, and, and pulling in stories, that itself, even if the stories don't necessarily work as you expect, that in itself is hugely valuable. So how do you make Australian audiences care about places that they might struggle to identify on a map? You know, Kabul, Yugoslavia... Um, it's, these parts of the world? It, it's, it's always a challenge. Um, the standard line, and I think it's standard for because it, there is a degree of truth in it, is that you need to find some kind of angle um, that Australian audiences can identify with. Now, I'm a little bit careful about the, that because, it, because that implies that if you can't find an angle, then audiences the story's aren't not interested yeah. the story's not worth telling, and that's absolutely not the case. Mm. But it is always helpful, and, and this is what happened in Yugoslavia when I went. Um, the commander of, this, of um, the UNMOS, as it was known, the UN Military Observer Force, was an Australian officer. And at the time that I arrived, he was just leaving that job to take on a new role as, as the UN Secretary General's military advisor on the Balkans. And so I thought, look, what a great time to do a profile on a guy who's in the middle of this conflict who is an Australian, who I can talk to our audience as an Australian, um, but who would also be able to talk through the story um, from a really intimate perspective. He knew and understood the conflict because he'd been living it and observing it, literally, for, for years. Um, and so that was a really good way of... of a, a really good vehicle for channeling, channeling that, that yarn. A similar thing um, in South Africa was an Australian federal police officer who was training South African police in a more sort of civilised form of policing. The South African police had traditionally been trained as paramilitaries um, instead of constables and, 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 uh, and police officers. They had uh, military ranks um, and so the AFP officer was trying to teach them more around um, civil policing. And um, Again, telling the story of what was happening in South Africa through his eyes was, was really, really valuable. But as, as you just mentioned, that's not the only way. And if, if, that's what you, if that's your criteria, then it, it all starts to look a little bit parochial. Mm. Um, fundamentally, it's about telling 
the stories that involve people. And I don't care whether it's an Australian audience or um, you know, foreign uh, British audience or anywhere else. It's always about finding those really good human stories, stories about what we call real people, you know, <laughs> people who are on the front lines, ordinary people who are engaged in these stories in a way that's meaningful. That's a universal skill. It doesn't matter what, whether you're telling a story about, um, you know, flooding in outback Queensland um, or a story of, of, of a war in Afghanistan. If you can find those human stories, find those people, make those people, tell stories in ways that, that help those people connect to your audience, you've, you've, you've got a good yarn. One of the things we find sort of back at this sort of training level when we're working with students is that they often um, find it hard to move beyond safe stories, fluffy stories, maybe nice stories. Have you got any advice for students about stretching into some more challenging territory? Gosh, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's because, particularly when you're starting out, that you don't feel as though you've got a great deal of personal authority as well. Um, and it's hard to front up and to someone who's in the middle of a very important big story, whether it's a, a conflict, a political dispute, or some other more serious issue, when you don't feel as though you've got the weight of an institution behind you. But my, I, I always think that understanding that even a single reader is still important and, and your audience is made up simply of a collection of, of individuals. Um, and if you understand that, then one indi any one individual is as important as any other and so you, you have as much authority as the ABC's political reporter to ask the Prime Minister a question. That's a, you know, it's as simple as that. Um, and I think if you understand, if you see and recognise that the work that you're doing, it does, for whoever it is, still carries significance, then, then I think it, it gives you that sense of licence and authority to go and, and, and tackle the more, the, the bigger stories. And you still bring you into that yes. conversation and that, that perspective. I really wanted to kind of have a conversation about this part of your career because I think, you know, what comes next tends to be, you know, the, the focus of, of so much. And, you know, we remember that the reason that that happened is because you'd had this amazing career doing telling these stories from all over the world. But to run through what happened in Egypt in December 2013, you and two of your Al Jazeera colleagues were arrested um, on charges including falsifying news and portraying the new Egyptian government in a negative light. You were convicted and given a seven-year sentence and in your time in prison you had to endure solitary confinement and you finally deported back to Australia in 2015. Super high-profile case um, with interventions from the UN Secretary-General and the US Secretary of State. Um, and when you were back in Australia, you continued to fight for the pardon of your colleagues um, who were finally granted release as well, um, about, I think, a month after your release. So how do you... How do those events live in your life now? Is it frustrating that this is still so much part of your present and what we continue yeah. to talk about? Well, it is, and it is. it's frustrating because it's become the thing that defines me. Um, and I wish, in a lot of respects, that people knew and understood my previous life as a correspondent. You know, as I said, I had 25 years as a as a foreign correspondent before then, um, and I'm very proud of the work that I did then. But I also recognise that that's given me a licence to talk about press freedom issues that I wouldn't otherwise have had. Um, it's given me a profile and an authority to raise these issues, both within the public but also at political levels. And so, yes, it's frustrating and I wish in a lot of respects that it hadn't happened. I wish I could just not have that, that part of my life because of the way that it's changed it's changed my life, but I also realise that it's, as a result of that, I feel like I've got a responsibility now to, to pay it forward um, and to try and argue very strongly for, for these issues around press freedom. And that's why I keep, I keep, I keep talking about it. 
I guess the other thing too, Alan, is that they, I feel a little bit of bloody mindedness. You know, <laughs> the Egyptians tried to shut us down. You know, the, the, the heart of the core of everything. It, this was an attempt to silence press freedom, to smother press freedom. And so every time I have a camera and, and microphones and an audience, it's a it's a it's a way of saying to the Egyptians, "Screw you! <laughs> you, 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 you you've just made it worse for yourselves." Um, and and so in that respect too, it's it's actually about validating the 400 days that I had stuck in a concrete box um, instead of that period being a hole in my life that I'll never be able to get back. Talking about these issues means that I'm actually applying meaning retrospectively to that period. I'm not sure if this is a, a prying question, but does it, at a personal level, is that something you can move on from? Is there still, does that still impact on your life? Um, it more, Im it, so, yeah. It more impacts on my life in the way that... So I think implicit in your question, and, and I'm very happy to talk about this around, around PTSD, I right. think. Is that what you're, you're getting Well, at? I mean, I, I wouldn't have defined it, I wouldn't have categorised it, but I, and I'm naive to these things because I think most of us can't imagine what that would be. So there's probably a voyeuristic curiosity, I think, yeah. that, but which I, this is why I say I don't know if it's... An appropriate thing to ask. Well, no, it's perfectly, it's perfectly appropriate. I mean, it's, it, you know, it was a hugely traumatic experience, but I don't feel damaged by it. And it, it's not something that disturbs me or, or, or traumatises me in any way. In fact, in a lot of ways, and my partner talks about this quite a lot, she feels that adjusting back to normal life has been more traumatic, has been more challenging than the period that I had in prison itself. In fact, I was talking to Kylie Moore Gilbert, um, an Australian academic who's just come, who, who uh, was released from um, a really horrible period of imprisonment in Iran, mm. um, and she said the same thing: that the, the 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 period of adjustment is more difficult because everybody expects that you you just sort of fit back into normal life, when in fact it's had a really profound effect, and it's changed my sense of identity. It's changed um, how the public sees me. It's forced me to abandon a life that I really loved and I was really enjoying and take on duties and responsibilities that are really not natural to me in a lot of ways. And so in that respect, it's been, it has been challenging, but not in the way that most people think. Yeah, I wondered about that because I wonder in which, you know, as, as someone who has lived in other parts of the world, something I've done as well, there's quite... It's a big thing to come back to yeah. Australia, and I wonder if you feel caged in a different way, yes. not being able to to roam yes. and do the work that you yes. were able to do previously. Uh, absolutely, you know, I, <clears throat> as you know, you, you, you said yourself you're ten years away. Um, I had twenty six years, and that you know that gets into your blood, into your DNA. It's a part of not only how you see the world, but how how you see yourself, but how you relate to the world, um, and. Australia is, a, you know, a wonderful place, but but it can feel a little bit caging. I don't want to suggest for a second that I'm unhappy in Australia. Don't get me wrong, but it's just it's having different. To, it, it's different, and having to put down that life um, as a foreign correspondent has been has been a real challenge. Yeah, and becoming the story. How mm. I mean, and and you have to straddle this world now, where you both try and tell the story, but also become the story. Yeah, that was. That was weird, particularly in the early stages, um, where there was so much interest in, in me and, and my story. And that was never something I was ever particularly comfortable with. You know, as you know, you're constantly told as a journalist, you know, the story isn't about you. It's, it's, it, it's always about, about the other people. You've got to reduce your, your impact on the story as much as possible. But again, um, once I understood that this was a way of validating the time that I'd had locked up um, I, and a way of, of leveraging my story to focus attention on what I think are the much more significant, much more serious questions of press freedom, then I, I realised it was something that, that I could... I could live with, I could, get on, I could get on board with. I'm still much happier that I get to sit in this chair and you have to sit in that one. Um, we have a situation at the moment with an Australian journalist, um, Cheng Li, who's de detained in China. What is the role of the Australian government in protecting journalists abroad? I think, I think Australia has a hugely important role and a role that, frankly, I don't think they're living up to. I don't think they're responding for, sufficiently to. Um, 
and it's a really complex question because there are three, I guess in a way there are three key layers to it. There's Australia's responsibility um, to look after its citizens, its nationals who are in prison abroad. It's got a, a duty of care, um, a responsibility to see that they're, that they're looked after, that they're treated with respect, that they're treated with due process and so on. There is the strategic interest that Australia has as a, um, in, in, in running its diplomacy. Um, and when you're dealing with a power like China, having an Australian national in Chinese in a Chinese prison is a really complicated, um, a complicated equation to run. But it also has the, that principle of, of defending press freedom um, to look after. Now, Australia presents itself as a leading um, democratic power in the region. It presents itself as taking these very principled positions on human rights issues, on freedom of speech, freedom of the press. It's very difficult for Australia to, to talk that talk without, with any credibility if it's not prepared to stand up for its own nationals, its own journalists, when they're imprisoned in places like China, if it's not prepared to say this is wrong and fight very forcefully for that person's release. Um, and I think in Cheng Lei's case, um, we haven't seen any evidence that the Chinese government has insisted that it's a national security case, and so the, the trial was held utterly in secret. Um, we haven't had a, a verdict yet, much less a sentence, but um, I think most observers expect that she's going to be convicted in some way. The Australian government has really been, I think, shamefully silent on her case. Um, they say that they're giving all sorts of diplomatic support, and I do know that they are doing what they can diplomatically, but that um, and consular support. But that consular support is a very personal, individual level. It's not on the principle of protecting um, not just um, an Australian journalist, but uh, the principle of, of, of press freedom in, in an authoritarian state like China. And I guess, you know, when we're dealing with these kinds of um, regimes where there are things that happen that, that we get to see and there are things that we don't ha that happen that we don't get to see, it's hard to know potentially what the Australian government is doing or... Yeah, and it says that the, it, it, the Australian government talks a lot about quiet diplomacy. Um, I'm very, very sceptical of quiet diplomacy. Um, if, it was, if, if we'd allowed only quiet diplomacy to work, in my case, and I'm convinced I'd still be in prison. Um, in a way, and this is also what happened in, um, in Kylie Moore Gilbert's case as well, in fact, quite a lot of cases, the um, DFAT's default position is to advocate for quiet diplomacy, to let the diplomats have their discussions, to do it without a fuss, don't raise the profile of the story, don't add publicity or noise uh, or confusing messages to the conversations that the diplomats are having, let them do their job. And I can understand why your instinctive reaction would be that way, but we've, but I found, and Kylie also believes wholeheartedly, that foreign governments are sensitive to public opinion, that they are aware of of what takes place on Twitter and Facebook. They might not like the messages, but they're capable of making a distinction between the very nuanced messages that come out of the mouths of our diplomats and perhaps close family members and spokespeople of, of those who are in prison, and the the vitriolic noise, and often quite xenophobic, quite foul noise, which you see on Twitter and Facebook. And my family decided very quickly that, that actually that noise, even though it might have been in a lot of ways quite offensive to the Egyptians, the Egyptians would be able to make that distinction. But what it did was that it actually raised the political and diplomatic pressure on Australian diplomats and gave them the authority to say, look, we've got this issue back home, we can't normalise our relationships until you sort this out. It gave the politicians the political clout that they needed to prioritise our case, to make it, to, to actually act on it, to get involved <clears throat> and put some energy into, into, the, into the issue. And so in all sorts of ways, I think um, a, a noisier public campaign is helpful. Now, that's not to say that it is universally helpful. Uh, there are certainly going to be cases where it can be destructive, but I think that in a lot, in, in far more cases than we've seen, um, it's a, it's a positive thing.
while you were in Egypt, um, the Australian government was passing national security laws that would potentially criminalise journalists here. Um, these included amendments to the 2014 Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act that entailed a five to ten year prison term for those who have disclosed information relating to a special intelligence operation. Section 36P, yeah. Uh, and amendments to the Telecommunications Interception and Access, or TIA Act, which was passed in 2015. Mm -hmm. Metadata legislation. And uh, which was requiring phone and internet providers to retain for two years particular types of telecommunications data, which could impact journalists' abilities to protect sources. What's your reaction to those developments? It's not just those developments, by the way. Um, even since then, we've seen things like whistleblower legislation. We've seen the Espionage Act. Um, we've seen a whole host of pieces of laws that are all framed as national security legislation, but in either direct ways or indirect ways, undermine journalists' ability to, to investigate the government and to protect their sources and to hold government to account in the process, to do effectively perform their democratic duties, their responsibilities. And I'm frankly deeply troubled by the trend in Australia. Um, in the latest World Press Freedom Rankings released by Reporters Without Borders, Australia slipped from 25th place to 39th place. And RSF said specifically it was because of this continued erosion of press freedom by Australian national, draconian national security legislation. Since 9-11, Australia has been the world leader in national security legislation. We've passed more than 90 separate pieces of legislation that intrudes in some way on, most of it intrudes in some way on our, on our civil liberties, including the ability of journalists to do their jobs. Um, we can talk about the, the, the implications of each particular law, if you like, but generally speaking, so let's go back to, um, to May of 2019. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a founding director of an organisation called the Alliance for Journalist Freedom, the AJF, and we published a white paper that year that, that brought together all of those pieces of le legislation, looked at Australia's, <clears throat> at the environment and said, look, in Australia we have um, national security legislation that undermines journalists' ability to protect their sources, that exposes their metadata to overbearing government investigation, that criminalises a lot of otherwise legitimate journalistic inquiry. Um, and at the time, a lot of critics said, look, you guys are being all tinfoil-hatted, you're being extreme, of course we don't have any problems in Australia, look at, um, look at just how free press is, anybody can criticise the government in the papers, there's no problem. Um, and then two weeks after we published our white paper, we saw the AFP raiding news organisations, from or two news organisations, looking for evidence of sources to two national security um, stories that involved classified information. And in both of those cases, the stories were indisputably in the national interest, in the public interest. The public had a right to know about what the government was doing in, in, in those names. And so all of a sudden, everything that we'd said had come to pass. Now, we saw a couple of parliamentary inquiries after those AFP raids. We saw a whole host of public commentary. We saw a great deal of commitment to reforming national security legislation. And since then, what have we had? More legislation. And no charges. And no charges. No charges laid. No. Why do you think it's... You would, you would think, as we learn more and we understand about the world and, and we see what happens um, with author authoritarian regimes that we wouldn't necessarily ramp these things up. Why, why because, has this changed? OK, there are a couple of reasons. 9-11, I think, changed everything. Mm. Um, this is my, my, my big thesis, is that in a lot of the wars pre-9-11, there were wars over tangible things that you could stick your finger on, like land or water, ethnicity. And in those conflicts, journalists were observers. Now, you're still targeted often if you're uncovering something that the belligerents don't like, but you're not seen as a participant in the conflict. But 9-11 became a conflict over ideas, over isms. The war on terror is a war over an idea. Um, and in a war over ideas, the place where ideas are transmitted becomes the media itself, and journalists, whether you like it or not, are seen as, as players in this conflict and targets. And so 
we've seen national security, the idea of national security, extend to ideas and to, and to concepts and to journalistic inquiry. And I think that's a real problem. Conceptually, that's a massive problem. And this is not an abstract problem. The reason, that's one of the reasons that we, we saw the AFP raids. It's one of the reasons that we saw national security legislation, loosely framed national security legislation in Egypt that was used to come after legitimate journalism, which was what we were doing. Now, I'm not suggesting that Australia is about to become Egypt, but the political trends, the political headwinds that created that environment in Egypt are the same political trends that have encouraged or allowed the Australian government to pass loosely framed national security legislation that has then been used to come after uncomfortable journalism. And we don't have any serious political opposition. The coalition keeps talking about how it's strong on national security. We know that Labor is vulnerable to being criticised, to being wedged on national security, so it doesn't ever really put up serious opposition to national security laws. And so in the end what we're seeing is this rush, not, not even a, a creep, a rush towards, frankly, what I think is authoritarianism. And it's hard to make that case in Australia because, as I said, our journalism looks free and open enough. We've got this fire hose of information coming out of our devices every time we open them up. But if you look, if you scratch beneath the surface, you'll see that there is a very, very clear chilling effect on, on the work that journalists are able to do. Sources are drying up. We know from a lot of the research that we've been doing that, that sources within government are now no longer willing or able to speak to journalists because those communications are vulnerable to investigation by the Australian Federal Police <clears throat> without any kind of warrant, without, ever being, without it ever being revealed. Um, we know that a lot of journalists aren't following stories because of the risks of prosecution. Now, part of that's because of, of simply of the danger of, 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 of going to prison, but part of it's also because journalists don't have the resources any longer to, to fight these issues in court. And so, overall, the law is doing what it's supposed to do, and that's having a deterrent effect. The dampening. And when it comes to journalism, I don't think that's a healthy thing at all. What about the public's role in this, as you say, I think that perception of the fact that we turn, we're, we're flooded with what appears to be journalistic con content uh, everywhere we turn. And I think, I wonder to what extent there's still this perception that those kinds of problems, those kinds of regimes happen over there. Yeah. Like there's this... Yeah, know, they happen in dictatorships in exactly. Egypt, in China, in North Korea and stuff, not, not here in a, in a democracy like Australia. Yeah. But I think we've... Again, I think we've allowed ourselves to sleepwalk into this. And I'm, I'm, go I'm actually going to call it now. I think um, News Corp in particular um, has, a, you know, has a very strong national security story to tell. Um, it's been very... A, a lot of its commentary, a lot of its journalism is focused on the threats to national security. And so it's, there's, a, there's a dialogue around national security which talks about the risks that Australia is facing. Um, and so the political narrative, and it's not only News Corp, of course, I mean, you know, as I said, there's a lot of political um, debate which encourages uh, the securitisation of, of the state. Um, but I don't think we've really had the serious discussion around the consequences of, the, of those laws on our democracy. Um, you know, and, and what, one of the things we've been trying to do, one of the, thing, the arguments I've been trying to make is that, in fact, if national security is about anything, then it must be not just about protecting lives and property of Australians, but must also be about protecting the integrity of our political system. And so if you're passing laws in trying to keep us physically safe that ultimately end up undermining one of the key pillars of our democratic system, then actually national security isn't served. It's, it's, it's damaged. And, and I think if people understand that, then I think, and if they understood the consequences of, of, of that kind of legislation, then I think Australians would feel a lot less comfortable with the way in which we're, we're heading. 
is the intangibility of this stuff a factor? We're talking yeah. about things that are, you it know... It feels when, very much in the abstract. Yeah, it? it's sort of in the ether, right? Yeah. It's, you know, information, it's hacky mm. things, it's, it, you know, it's dark, webby kinds. Like, it, it, we can't hold on to these things in the way that we used to be able to uh, or see physical threats in the way that we did before. Yeah, and that's also why the AFP raids were actually very, very helpful to us because it showed people that actually this stuff is important. And let's just go back. It's worth reminding people what those raids were all about. Yeah. One raid was on Annika, uh, looking for the source of a story by Annika Smethurst, who was exposing a conversation, an internal conversation within government about expanding the powers of the Australian Signals Directorate to spook, to spy or eavesdrop on, on domestic communications. Now, the ASD is the Australian equivalent of the NSA in the US, the National Security Agency, which uses incredibly sophisticated eavesdropping equipment to listen in on email communications, on mobile phone communications, on, on internet online communications all over the world outside of its own borders. The ASD does the same thing here. And the idea that the ASD could use those incredibly sophisticated technologies to spy domestically is a huge step and something that affects every single Australian. And so, again, I'm not making a judgment about the right, whether that's right or wrong. What I'm, what I'm saying is that conversation needed to be public, needed to be a part of the public domain and the public needed to be involved in that because if that's what the public wants, that's fine, but it needs to be debated and discussed within public. And it wasn't. It wasn't happening. That's what Annika Smethurst was exposing. Nothing in that story that she wrote genuinely exposed anything that damaged national security, but it did depend on a classified document. And that's what the problem was. The story exposed something that was classified. Um, the other story was by the ABC, exposing allegations of war crimes by Australian special forces in Afghanistan, again dependent on the leak of classified information, classified documents. Now again, the ABC didn't publish anything that damaged the security of Australian Special Forces. No information was published that was, was genuinely damaging to security. And the story, I think, was absolutely, indisputably in the public interest. Mm. And again, the police have gone after the sources of that story. They accused the ABC of receiving leaked, oh, sorry, of receiving stolen Commonwealth property. Now, if you think about it for a moment, any system that criminalises journalism, that exposes stories like that, that are absolutely in the public interest, is a system that is failing us. And a system that is making Australians far less poorer, far poorer, far less aware of what our governments are doing. And that's why I think this is something that we need constantly to remind people of. Now, the fact that we're not seeing more raids, I think, is, is, is because, actually, a lot more of those stories aren't, aren't taking place. We're not seeing the kinds of stories that, sh that we should be. So did we need to see more public outrage <laughs> of the... Are we, it, it's, you know, I think that's still my concern. I guess it's that age-old, you know, it's like making the international story relevant to the local audience? How do we make this local story relevant, in a sense? Yeah. Are people hearing it? Why, why I, aren't people outraged? Because I think the story's moved on. We've had the parliamentary inquiries. They issued their... They tabled their reports, you know? Um, and, and, frankly, I think the media itself is partly to blame. We've, we've got our own short attention spans. We've moved on. Um, and, again, this is why I keep trying to raise these in, in, in whenever I can, these issues wherever we can. I think there's a general understanding within politicians that there is a problem to be addressed, but there isn't the political imperative, and I find it incredibly frustrating. And I wish I had an easy answer for you. I, I don't. But I think it is something we need to be far more concerned about than, than we have been. So where do we go from here? Well, um, one of the things that, that we argued for in um, our in our white paper was a Media Freedom Act. We said that, see, Australia, there is no explicit protection for press freedom or even freedom of speech anywhere in Australian statutes. Which I think surprises people. We it assume, does surprise we people. assume that we, it's there. We assume that it's there. We have this ridiculously loose, weak 
implied right of political communication, which comes from one judgment in the High Court um, back in the 1990s. But that's it. We, we, there is nothing in our constitution that says that, that there is a guaranteed, there is a guarantee for press freedom or freedom of speech. Constitutional amendment would be the gold standard, of course, but we all know that in Australia that is very, very difficult to achieve. And so we're arguing for a Media Freedom Act, which would just require an act of parliament, which would have largely the same effect. It would be a piece of law reform legislation that effectively says that it wouldn't require us to go through and change every piece of legislation because that is just too too onerous a task and you're never actually ever going to really deal with all of the with every single piece of legislation that could possibly um, affect press freedom but what you could do is say that in any case where press freedom is involved the courts have to take the impact of the judgment on press freedom into account and you're also saying that in any law that's being passed in future lawmakers have to take the impact of that legislation on press freedom also into account and make sure that if there is an impact that um, press freedom is written in or a defence around press freedom is written into the legislation. And we think that would be fairly straightforward, but it would also have a profound effect on the way that legislators work and a profound effect on the way that the courts work. Um, now, Are there, are there any other countries using <coughs> models like that? Or is this quite innovative? No, it is quite innovative. But I've spoken to a lot of legal experts who think that it's perfectly achievable and it would work. Um, and when you talk to politicians privately, again, they all, understand, they all acknowledge the problem <clears throat> and they acknowledge that this is actually quite possibly a good solution, but there isn't the political momentum. Now, who knows, maybe with a change of government um, we might see an opportunity to, 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 to push these ideas, um, but I think we, 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 need, we do need some more political debate. We do need people talking and thinking about it. Um, small, small steps. Yeah. Peter, it has been such a delight to talk to you. Um, it, it, you know, there are always conversations that I feel like we could <laughs> go on with, but I've um, really enjoyed it. Thank you for sharing your insights. No, it's been fantastic, Helen. I've had a great time. Thanks.